So, I have a question for you. What is democracy? What do you understand by the term democracy? And the constitution we are using today in Africa, who developed this constitution? The other day, I was watching Odemaya in Jamaica, in USA and those other countries. I noticed some people are driving on the left, some people are driving on the right. Who brought these to Africans? And Africans, after the, after the white man left, after his oppressive government, we adopted this same government that was oppressing Africans, and now we are using the same government to rule ourselves. Which brings up the question, what is really democracy? According to Abraham Lincoln, this, this is what he said. Democracy is the government of, uh, is a government for the people and of the people to the people. A government of the people for the people and to the people. It means uh, a government which serves the people. However, not everyone will always be served by democracy. So think of it more of a majority rule and it's a majority rule and the minority are also respected. In this video, Julius, Ma um, not Julius Malema, but Pierre Lumumba is able to address uh, the issue of adopting a Western kind of government. Uh, the issues of uh, today we have uh, the constitution, the constitution which is very biased, the constitution which oppresses Africans. As Africans, personally as I believe, and what Pierre Lumumba is going to say right now, uh, Africans, we should develop our own constitution. We should not rely on the constitution that was once used to oppress us. So without further ado, I want us to jump into this video, uh, watch what watch what PLO Lumumba is going to say, and then by the end of the video, I'll give you my thoughts and critical analysis by the end of the video. There's so much to learn about Africa and its governance in this video. Let's dive in right away. I'm very slow to use that word in the recent past. Because who defines democracy? What is it? Is it about the periodic meetings or elections that we hold every so often? Is it equal to governance? Who defines democracy? Many years ago, a great African-American John Henry Clark, who is a great Pan-Africanist, observing the many African countries that were regaining independence, said that when African countries regained independence, all of them inherited systems of government that were inherited from their former colonizers. And he went on to say, and none of them will ever succeed on the basis of those inherited governance systems. There is a sense in which those words now ring true. We are in a continent that is today divided into 54 countries out of a scheme which was hatched by European powers in 1884 and 1885 when they sat in Berlin to divide the continent of Africa into spheres of influence, into hunting grounds. The British had their hunting ground, the French did, the Belgians did, the Italians did, the Germans did, the Portuguese did. Then of course, we resisted them and they appeared to leave and we celebrated. But the question is, did they leave? And if they leave, if they, leave, they left the continent in which they lived and still are leaving, what impact did they have? Is the impact still with us? Have we liberated ourselves? And why did we drive them away? I can still remember those words that I 
listened to every soft spoken on the 6th day of March 1957 by Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah that the independence of Ghana means nothing if the rest of Africa is not free. I can still remember him saying that we are regaining independence, that we may govern ourselves, that we may harness our resources, that we may have education that is in the best interest of our people, that we may take control of our cocoa and coffee and yams. The question this afternoon, have we? The question is, after all the countries regained independence and we started electing our leaders, did they change? Did they husband our resources in a better way? I can still remember in 1958, when the same Kwame Nkrumah invites leaders in Accra, Ghana in 1958 and tells them that we are not truly really free. There is another project that has inherited colonialism. It is neo-colonialism. And I can remember him moving two years later in Casablanca, Morocco and telling his audience this independence that we think we have regained, we will lose it. We will lose it because the neo-colonizer has not left. He is with us and he is using some of us and he is the enemy from within that we must be wary of. And he did not stop there. Three years later, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, 32 African countries are now independent. Each one of them, heads of states, talking about Africa, about African unity, about the need to have one army, about the need to have one government, about the need to have one currency, about the need to have a common unified foreign policy, but they listened to him not. And we had a weak organization called the OAU, which made its contribution, participated in the liberation of other African countries. But the question is, is Africa the richer because we regained independence? You will remember that even as we regained independence, the other country still remained here. And it's only in the 1980s that we see other African countries regaining their independence. You'll remember the wars of independence in Angola. You'll remember the wars of independence in Mozambique. You'll remember the wars of independence in Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde. And you'll remember the last bastion of man's inhumanity to man in South Africa in 1984, preceded only by liberation from the regime in what is now Zimbabwe. The question is, the promises that our founding fathers made to us, have we fulfilled them as we talk about democracy and constitutions? Who brought the constitutions to us? Which constitutions do our traditional rulers operate from? Are they written? For whose interests are they written? As I talk about democracy and development now, I want you to cast your eyes across the continent of Africa now. Look at young people dying as they leave the coast of Senegal. When you tell them about democracy and elections, are you talking to them when they are dying? When they are dying in the Mediterranean, are you talking to them? 
If you go into a room where there are 10 young Africans, eight of them want to run away from the continent of Africa, even in countries where there are so-called constitutional governments. This is the Africa that we are talking about today. When you go to Australia, Europe, and America, young Africans are being humiliated. If you doubted it, you only saw what happened in Ukraine when the war broke out. See how Africans were being humiliated. The question that we are asking today and the question that is alive and well today and the debate that we ought to wrap our minds around today is what is democracy? Whose democracy? Is there a possibility that we who are gathered here today as Carter G. Woodson said in 1933 we are so thoroughly miseducated that in fact even when we think we are getting it right, we are getting it wrong. Is it a possibility that one of the things that we must do in assemblies such as this and at all times is to unlearn some of the indoctrination to which we have been subjected so that we may learn things that can help the continent of Africa? How is it that every time we think that we have diagnosed the disease properly and that we have a new antidote when we apply that antidote a new wound appears how is it how is it that when we regained independence in 1960 it started with coup d'etats and as we speak now we have coup d'etats if our memories are not serving as well don't you remember that no sooner had Congo regained independence in 1961 than there was a coup d'etat and Patrice Emery Lumumba was killed. If you doubt me, is it not the case that in 1963 in Togo they killed Silvanus Olympia? If you doubt me, is it not the truth that in 1966 they overthrew Kwame Nkrumah? Is it not the truth that in this country they took away the government of Namdi Azikiwa and Abubakar Tafawa Balewa in 1967? Is it not true that they eliminated Modibo Keita in Mali? That they took away Ahmed Ben Bella in Algeria? So our story is as the French would say, plus a change. Plus la même change. The more things change, the more they remain the same. And if that is the case, we must ask ourselves uncomfortable questions, which will give us uncomfortable answers. Many times we don't want to ask those uncomfortable questions because we know the answers and we do not want to hear the answers. And we are assembled here to remind ourselves that the reason why we lament about Africa is that it appears that the systems of governance that we inherited and that we have been deploying for our benefit continue to put us at the foot of the ladder we do not complain because there have been no changes and improvement in our circumstances. In certain cases, there have been. But as Uganda's Yoweri Museveni says, and I agree with him, what is the point of fighting as to who is taller than the other when you are all dwarfs? This is the space in which Africa finds herself. So that the state of California in the United States of America has a GDP bigger than all the countries of Africa combined. This is undesirable. It is undesirable that a country which is great in prospect, for example, like Nigeria, with a population of 250 million, generates less power than Costa Rica, which 
has a population of 5 million and generates three times more power than Nigeria is undesirable. This is what we are talking about. We are talking about countries which have GDPs, which ought not to be the GDP that they have. And we are saying that this must be because of the systems of governance that we have. I heard His Royal Majesty so very keenly and I agree with him. What must we do? What is the nexus between good governance and development? And what is development? I remember Julius Kambarage Nyerere saying in 1966 that when they come and tell us that development are roads and airports, we agree with them. But that is not the end of development. The, end, the beginning and the end of development is human resources, Mwalimu said. Mwalimu said, and I agree with him, you can build roads and destroy roads. You can build the airports and rebuild the airports. But when you build human beings intergenerationally, the airports that you destroy come out of their minds. So we must also redefine what development is. We have seen countries where edifices were christened to constitute development and they were destroyed in the twinkling of an eye. But the human spirit is resilient and is constantly seeking liberation. The human spirit is constantly yearning for something to fulfill it. And that something is what sometimes we refer to as the social contract. That no man or no group of men who have arrogated to themselves the monopoly of knowledge and wisdom must never ever assume that they are God's gift to man to govern and rule them as they will. That is the duty of men willingly to surrender their will to men that they may govern them. So the next thing that we must interrogate in Africa is who is the leader? Because we have too many individuals in Africa occupying offices who are not leaders, they are merely misleaders. And the time is now therefore to ask ourselves, and I can still remember you are now immortal words, Honorable and Excellency President in 2015, when you said so very ably that your ambition was not worth the blood of the people of Nigeria. When you spoke those words, I do not know what came to your mind, but you must have received a sudden enlightenment because those words underlined the fact that men must know when to stop. And the appropriate time you stopped. And Nigeria was the richer because you stopped. We live in a continent today where every election is a harbinger for chaos. But you said, let it go. We have a saying in Kiswahili, asiataka kushindu asim shindani, he who does not want to be defeated is not a contestant. Today, when we talk about leadership, we are talking about people to recognize that it's not a cutthroat competition. Unfortunately, in Africa, leadership and the quest for it is a cutthroat competition where throats are actually cut. So we must also, in addition to define democracy and governance and leadership, ask ourselves, 
who is a leader? You know, many years ago as a young man, I watched a movie, which movie has stuck in my mind. It was in 1982. And I went to the theaters and I went with a notebook. And the movie was Gandhi by Sir Richard Attenborough. And at that time, Mahatma Gandhi or Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi had been invited back from South Africa by one of the great Indian nationalists, Professor Gokhale. And when he was invited to speak, this is what he said. I have nothing to say, but today as I see you here, the people who are assembled here are businessmen and lawyers from Delhi. You are pretending to speak to India and for India, this is not India. India is out there in the villages, in the hamlets. This is not Nigeria. Nigeria is out there in the municipalities. This is not Africa. Africa is out there in Bangi, in Nwakchat, in Khartoum where they are fighting, in Pirda. Africa is out there in Niamey. Africa is out there in Ouagadougou. Africa is out there in Bamako, in the slums of Bamako. When we speak here in English, do we reach them? When we speak in French, do we reach them? When we speak in Portuguese, do we reach them? What is the Yoruba word for democracy? What is the Ijo word for democracy? What is the Ibibio word for democracy? What is the Ibo, Ibo word for democracy? Give me that word. When you give me that word, then we are beginning a conversation. Because that conversation is the conversation that is going to tell us how we have a symbiotic relationship between democracy and the thing that we call development. You know, this mother continent, this continent that remains in the stage in which it remains, is a continent that continues to suffer even because of external factors. But we have blamed the others for too long. We must begin to blame ourselves. Oh, we have blamed the British and they deserve to be blamed. When we belong to the Commonwealth and we call our ambassadors, high commissioners, we deserve to blame them because our political true north appears to be the United Kingdom. That's where when we have our presidents and they want to contest elections in Africa, they go to Chatham so that their masters can listen to them and say, it's okay. So we can blame the British and they deserve to be blamed. We deserve to blame the French. Because before you are elected into one of their countries, you've got to go to Paris and they've got to say, c'est la vie. Then they say, très bien. And then we know that you come back home and you are simply a manager of a plantation. And if you had any doubt about that, just see what is happening in Niger when the French president says, I will not remove my ambassador. And Africa says nothing about it. And even when they say anything about it, they say it mutedly and they sanitize their language lest they annoy Paris. And the same happens in Portugal. The same happens with the Belgians. I look forward to an Africa where things are done in the continent of Africa. And this continent of Africa has tried and there is no shortage of individuals who have tried to link democracy and development. In our midst, we have leaders. We have the former pre two former presidents here who served well. I've said this before, no matter how good a dancer you are, you must know when to leave the stage. 
There are too many dancers in Africa who think I'm only, I'm the only dancer in town. And until God calls me, I'm not leaving the stage. Such dancers will be removed by men. And that is how I explained the coup d'etat that are coming here in 1964, talking about the military interventions in civilian government. This is what Kwame Nkrumah said. The military have no business interfering with civilian governments. But if civilian governments misbehave, it may become necessary for a short period to disrupt their agenda so that they can midwife a new dispensation. It is in this context that we must understand the military interventions. But remember that true democracy requires and demands the eternal vigilance of the people because Africa has also seen a situation where military leaders remove their uniform and adorn suits and lo and behold, like Paul and Saul, they become civilians themselves. And therefore it is important even as we celebrate these military coups to remind ourselves that they are merely midwives and midwives are neither the father nor the mother nor the child. Their duty is to ensure that all the three are happy and we the population must be eternally vigilant. And that is why therefore when we talk about democracy we must ask ourselves what are we doing wrong? And we must also ask the question, are coup d'etats only mounted by men and women in uniform? No, I've seen coups mounted by judiciaries in Africa. I've seen coups being mounted by the political class in Africa. When people engage in sophistry in interpreting constitution, those are also coup d'etats. And I would want us, therefore, as we talk about strengthening democracy, we must also talk about strengthening institutions, whether it is in Kenya, whether it is in Zimbabwe, whether it is in Nigeria, whether it is in Ghana, we must have a culture of respecting institution. Sometimes in Africa, we behave as if institutions work on their own motion. No, institutions are as strong as the men and women who occupy them. If you have wrong men and wrong women in office, no matter how strong the institution you claim to be strong, it will not perform because the history of nature is one, garbage in, garbage out. And if that is the case, therefore, we who are gathered here and talking about governance, this is serious business. What we are talking about here is serious business. I want you to look at Africa now with me in Sudan in Khartoum because of bad governance and absence of democracy no schooling going on in Khartoum if you are a university professor no university to lecture at there is no agriculture going on there there are no health services going on there in Khartoum, the thing that they built, they are destroying. It will take generations to rebuild Sudan. We are talking about development. In the health sector, all the children that ought to have been vaccinated will not be vaccinated which means that all the disease that, that we had conquered will come back again so that the health burden will be that heavy. No food is being planted so that we'll once again be importing rice and wheat from Ukraine, which is at war. Look at the Sahel now. Mali is de facto divided into two, no agriculture going on. So that 
you will be importing chicken from Brazil, chicken from Brazil, chicken. No agriculture. I'm talking about development, brothers and sisters. If you are sick because there is no research going on in our universities, no research. We receive medicine from India, from China, and we take the medicine by faith because we do not know what they contain. Our bureaus of standardization have no standards for these things. And if you doubt me, only recently we had syrup imported from India. How many children did it kill in the Gambia? We have no standardization. So we are talking about serious business in Africa. Go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, the eastern part of it, over 120 armed groups. The busiest airspace in the continent of Africa, the rest of the world is taking our resources. There is a new scramble for Africa. Today, Africa is a theater for other worlds. If the British have gone and they have not gone, if the French have gone and they have not gone, if the Portuguese have gone and they have not gone, if the Belgians have gone and they have not gone, Chinese are also here. They are here building roads, building stadia. The Turks are here. The Qataris are here. The Russians are here. And yet Africans somehow believe that when we remove one slave master and we bring another slave master, then it's better. So we hear Africans praising Wagner in Russia. African intellectuals, I think the president of ECHO has called them pseudo-intellectuals, an appropriate and heavy English word. The question, therefore, is what must we do? Because there is a neo-colonial project and there is a new scramble for Africa. And Africa is moving from pillar to post, passing declaration after declaration. Africans are good at passing declarations. The Lagos Plan of Action of 1980. To develop Africa, did we fulfill it? No. The Yamasukuru Declaration on Free Airspace 1988, have we fulfilled it? No. The Abuja Declaration of 2001 to spend at least 15% of our budget in health, in health. Did we fulfill it? No. The Malabo Declaration on against terrorism and unconstitutional changes of government. Have we fulfilled it? It is as if it was steroid to tell others now that they don't want it, let's have it. Malabo. The Maputo Declaration on the rights of women and all these. Have we fulfilled them? The time is now that Africa should stop attending meetings. We should only have periodic meetings to ask ourselves how effectively have we implemented the declaration that we made. Because we are talking about governance. Otherwise, Africa is being tossed from pillar to post. I'm still talking about democracy and development. And you know, Africa is toes like yo-yo. Their leaders are invited to the G7. Once the photo is taken, then they go. Recently, we were invited to something called the G20. And then we celebrated, then we go. Then we are invited to the BRICS. Then we celebrate, then we go. Then we'll be invited to the G77, then we go. We are in the business of being invited to meetings. Ladies and gentlemen, one can go on and on, but I want to pose a number of questions as I bring my submission to the close. This continent of Africa, 
this continent that is divided into 54 countries, is it not the time now that we must examine what constitutes democracy? Is there something in our traditional governance systems that we can take and help how we govern? Is there something like that? This is a question that I want us to consider. Is there a possibility that the elections we hold that we do not understand are the actual disruptors of our democracy in Africa? That we spend so much time in them and that the only thing that lacks in African government is actually trust? Do we trust each other in Africa? I want to pose, where does Nigeria print her ballots? Is it in Nigeria? The answer is no. Does Kenya print her ballots in Kenya? No. Does Zimbabwe print her ballots in Zimbabwe? No. This is part of the problem. Trust. The third thing that we ask ourselves, do we prepare our leaders or young people to take over leadership in an environment that is understood by the population? Or we think that leadership is something that is God given to us and must never surrender? The question is, can we learn from others? Can we learn from others and implement creatively? The fourth thing that we must ask ourselves, what can we do to create an environment where our resources are deployed in a manner that is understood by the society? These are the questions that I think ought to be alive in our minds. And I want to conclude with this in 1997, the sixth day of March. The president of Tanzania, Mwalimu Kambarage Nyerere, was invited as a guest of honor on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Ghana's independence. And this is what he said. He said, several years ago, Kwame Nkrumah told us to unite. We refused to unite. We did not want unity because we thought that unity would solve all our problems. No. But we knew that if we are united, then the world will begin to respect us. Because the world does not recognize our Tanzanianness or Ghanaianness or Nigerianness. The world only sees us as Africans. And the day we begin to make serious contributions in agriculture, in the science, in the arts, and in all other spheres of development, that is the day that the world will stop and begin to respect us. I commend to you, ladies and gentlemen, that we give meaning to those words of Kambarage Nyerere. He went on, that our generation had a divine duty to liberate the continent of Africa from the yoke of colonialism. In the process of doing so, we made many mistakes, but who among us is without error? You, the generation that now exists today, it is your duty to lift Africa from another to another pedestal. And you can only lift the continent by doing certain things that are required of you. It will be tiring. It will be painful. But of all the sins that we have committed, there is one mistake that we must never commit. The mistake of giving up. I'm urging you today, we must never give up. And I see Africa today, we have tried many things, Africa Agenda 2063, Africa Continental Free Trade Area, all these are efforts that are being made and they can only happen in an environment where there is peace and tranquility. We promised ourselves that we would silence the guns in the year 2020, the guns are louder now. So as we are committing ourselves to this reality, I'm submitting to us that the continent of Africa has the ability, we have the human resource, which is the greatest of all resources. We have the natural resources, which can be harnessed through natural resources. We have men and women who can govern us. We have young men and women who are impatient. And if we are not very careful, this continent, which is great in prospect, will not realize our potential. The time is now. 
The time therefore is now. You leaders who are here, when you are seeking office, seek office that you may be servant leaders. The time is now. Those young men who are here who allow themselves to be used as cannon fodder by individuals who seek public office on the basis of ill-gotten wealth, the time is now to reject their money. The time is now for Africans, wherever they are, to remember that development will never come unless we have good, good governance. The time is now that African and African institutions must not receive instructions from institutions outside of the continent. The time is now that we Africans must exercise the ghost of low self-esteem. The time is now that we Africans must not think that we are only good when we receive a seal of approval from heads of states of other countries. The time is now for Nigeria particularly to rise to the occasion. One in every five black men in the world is Nigeria. Don't let us down. Rise up and lead the continent. God bless you. Today, today I want to challenge you the one thing. Many times we say that we want freedom. Many times we claim freedom is necessary. However, sometimes what's necessary is not the freedom. Because there's also a saying which goes, the means justifies, the end justifies the means. So people will take any extent to achieve freedom, even if it means trampling on other people, trampling on minorities, or maybe the majority in order to achieve their goal. To me, sometimes the freedom that we seek ain't really freedom. Remember what happened when the white man left Africa. Africans, we were, we want freedom, we want freedom. But then what happened? We pushed away the white person, the colonizer. When I say the white person, I mean the colonizer. We pushed him away and we elected our own selves. We elected fellow Africans. Nairobi in 1963, before 1964 or during that time, the economy of Nairobi was high, higher than that of Singapore, higher than that of China, higher than that of many Asian countries. That was when the white man was still here. But when the white man left, we thought we'd continue uh, building our economy. But that was not so. Our fellow black person was really, really an embezzling monster. Hungry monsters. They were very corrupt. They took any chance they got to make themselves rich at the expense of the Africans. So we were busy fighting the white person and we introduced another black person who had the characteristics even worse than that of the white person. And this is the African. Sometimes what we call freedom ain't really freedom. Unless it follows certain parameters. It has to follow certain parameters for it to be called freedom. Because sometimes, as I said, the end does not justify the means. An act cannot be good and bad at the same time. And this is the law, the law of non-contradiction in, in, uh, in philosophy. So, cutting this short, I want us to dive into a video that's trending online. This video uh, was made public, was made uh, it was a speech that was given by PLO Lumumba, uh, the Kenyan uh, scholar. He's really uh, renowned for making uh, powerful speeches. He's very good at rhetorics, and uh, I believe that he also leaves his talk. Because many times we might talk and not act. It happens. It's no good news. We, by now, as Africans, we should have known that. And now, in this particular video, PLO Lumumba is talking about coups. Are coups just? Is it necessary to have the coups? Is it necessary to have freedom at the expense of other people? Is it really necessary to do that? I remember in the early 1980s in Kenya, a coup was almost done, but it didn't go through. The president of then, uh, Daniel Toroi Tisharap Moi, was a very corrupt president. He was very corrupt, very immoral. I'm saying this because there is evidence 
surrounding my saying. He was corrupt since he did not allow Kenya to have other parties. Kenya was removed from multipartism to uniparty. It was just a single party. It was called KANU, Kenya African National Union. That is what we had back then. He refused all other parties. Remember during independence, we had other parties as well. During the struggle for independence, we had, had, had other parties. So people were angry, people were this and that. How dare you chase us away? We helped bringing freedom. And he sent them away, you know. So people were so angry, the military was so angry with this guy. There was a division in the military. As you know, the president is the chief commander-in-chief of the armed forces, all armed forces of the country. However, it happens that many of these are leaders, many of these are soldiers, were not in agreement with his leadership, with how he was doing things. What needed to be done by these leaders is that they chased away the idea of him ruling. There is a lot of things which people did not sit with, did not sit well with, the, with, with the people. During the reign of Moi, a lot of people died. A lot of political figures died. Every school had to have the picture of Moi. Almost every household. When, you, when Moi was traveling to your village, you better leave your house and go and stand by the road and carry a branch and say, Tawala Kenya, Tawala Raisi Moi, Tawala Kenya, Tawala. Tawala Kenya, Tawala is rain Kenya, rain. Rain in Kenya, rain for raining as ruling. That is how this person was so uh, a dictator. It was he was a serious dictator, and so it prompted a coup. People are not satisfied with the government. I'm giving a testimony of my country, my own country, before I go into another country. We have the situations in Mali. We have the situations in Burkina Faso. We have the situations in Niger. Many times we think that it is people with the uniforms that carry these coups. No. <laughs> Even my, people like myself can do that. People like myself are the ones who do It is the citizens, is what I mean. The citizens are the ones who carry these coups. It's not only the leaders. It's not only those people in the army. Those people in the army are the ones who actualize it. When a leadership is bad, and people are not satisfied, they attempt all means possible to uproot them. Remember, it is these very same people that worked so hard to elect these people into power. Yes, people right now are complaining about President Ruto. The price of living in Kenya has really skyrocketed. It's really hard here in Kenya. Uh, really, really hard. Paying rent is becoming hard for so many people. Eat, food is becoming hard. Traveling is becoming hard. People are, tra people are opting for online jobs because traveling is damn hard. Things are really hard in Kenya right now. And people who are complaining, some of them are people who elected President Ruto into power. This is what is happening. You know, when it comes to suffering, suffering does not choose you voted for me, you didn't vote for me. It, cut, it cuts across everyone. It cuts across. It's, a, it's an equalizer. Suffering is an equalizer. It doesn't choose. Ah, that damn bad. However, the coups that have been happening are at the expense of the Africans. I myself personally do not support coup attempts. I really do not. Uh, PLO Lumumba is giving justification of why it shouldn't happen. And he is also giving a reason why it should happen. So it's kind of a paradox. It's warm and cold at the same time. Uh, military coups are necessary where we have exhausted all the means. When all the means have exhausted, people always attempt for the coups. People attempt for that, you know. So people might be celebrating Russia. People might be celebrating uh, what other country? Russia, uh, these countries supporting Africa. We had the Wagner group moving to Western Africa. We had the people of France being taken away. They deserved that to me. To me, they deserved that. These people, the government, no, not the French people. I mean, I love the French people. The government was exploiting Africa. That government which was exploiting Africa had to be taken away to stop the exploitation. You get me? And so what happens is, it is necessary sometimes to, to go extra. 
it is necessary to protect by all means possible, as Malcolm X always says. All means possible in this term, in this context, it means the coup. Hmm? We might be supporting the Wagner group in Russia and here, but what are they really doing here? It's, there is no way I will, I will gamble my, there is no way I will gamble my freedom. I will chase the French and welcome the Russians. These people, in as much as they have different ideologies, they have the same agenda. Rule and rule. Because there is a part of gold mines or whichever mining, the mining they are doing there, does not have to be gold. We have other precious commodities under this soil. So they say, protect us, you take this. That is what we are told. In the Berlin conference, we, they, told Af they told people that we are going to help those Africans become better humans. Better humans means meant 10 million people are going to die are in the Congo. Pia Lolo Mumba is warning against such activities. Welcoming Jane, chasing away Joseph. Robbing Peter and paying Paul. There is no way that can happen. Mm -mm. Africa should be rid of colonizers. It should be rid of it. The white man came like that. He came with a very humble face. I did a video yesterday on the Berlin conference. There's a professor who explained this thing better. It, does, it always seems very harmless, very, very harmless at the face. At the face, very harmless. You can never be suspicious of it. But when time still continues to crawl by, it shows its claws and then it snatches you on its talons. You cannot escape that. So Africans need to be worried. Africans need to listen to what Pierre Lumumba said. We need to be very, very careful. And I'm grateful Pierre Lumumba has been able to open up and speak these words uh, openly. And I hope from this video we are able to learn from what uh, Pierre Lumumba said. For that reason, guys, kindly do subscribe to the channel. Give it a super thanks. I become a member of the channel. I will so much appreciate for your support. See you in the next video. Goodbye, stay African.